بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the brothers and sisters who are here from Maghrib. And Bashara is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in a hadith that ma zal al-abdu fi salah haythu yantazir salah A person will continually receive the reward of being engaged in prayer after he finishes one salah and is waiting for the next salah. And the uh, angels, they continue to make dua of maghfirah for the person. So all of the brothers and sisters been waiting there, uh, have been receiving that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and receiving the dua of the angels. Inshallah, tonight is Surah Al-Nasr, the 110th surah. As far as revelation is concerned, it is the 114th surah, the last surah to be revealed. As far as the order in the Quran is the 110th surah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بعد أن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the first ayah إذا when جاء نصر الله when the help of Allah سبحانه وتعالى when comes the نصر the help of Allah سبحانه وتعالى والفتح and open victory when comes the help of Allah سبحانه وتعالى إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح and the open victory. So this is giving a shart, this is giving a condition. When this happens, then what should you do? إذا means when. جاء comes. When comes. نصر الله. The help of Allah. والفتح and victory. When the help of Allah سبحانه وتعالى comes and the victory comes. What should you do? Another condition as well. Number one condition. Number two, وَرَأَيْتَ And when you begin to see, when you see, what do you see with your eyes? You will literally witness this, you will observe this. You will see nasa people, mankind. يَدْخُلُونَ They will be entering. فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ In the deen, in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will see the people. وَرَأَيْتَ You will see nasa the people. يَدْخُلُونَ Entering. في دين الله إن الدين في الله سبحانه وتعالى أفواجا in large crowds فوج در فوج in great large crowds you will see the people entering the دين في الله سبحانه وتعالى so when these two things happen what should you do فسبح ف means so so you should سبح glorify say the تسبيح of الله بحمد ربك along with با is with Along with Hamdi Rabbika, the praises and Hamd of your Rabb, of your Lord. Wastaghfirhu and seek His forgiveness. Wastaghfir, seek His, who? His forgiveness. This is what you should do. O oh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He is being addressed. Innahu, certainly, Beshak, Yaqeenan, definitely, Innahu, He is, Kana, He always is, Tawwaba. The one who will accept the tawbah and is ready to accept the forgive, uh, to ready to forgive his slave and accept his repentance. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa taala mm, is telling Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we will inshallah try to cover briefly the lessons we can learn from it too. But directly, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being addressed when you see these two things. When two things happen, number one, when the help of Allah and the open victory comes, ida jaa nasrullahi wal fatih. And number two, and when you begin to see mankind entering into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in great, great numbers. Simple. Num after that, then what you should do, O oh my Nabi, your wadifa in your responsibility, your duty is glorify Allah and along with His praise and seek His forgiveness. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is often returning and accepts the uh, tawbah of His slave. Now that we got a basic translation of the surah, this surah, Surah Al-Nasr, the another name for this surah is Surah Al-Tawdi'i' The surah of bidding farewell. And there's a very beautiful story about this uh, mentioned in the books of Hadith and mentioned in Sahih Bukhari as well. And in the books of Tafsir, this narration is there. Qal al-Bukhari rahimahullah Imam Bukhari rahimahullah narrate Haddathana Musa ibn Ismail, Haddathana Abu Uwana عن أبي بشر, عن Sa'id ibn Jubair عن ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال So this is a sanad between Imam Bukhari and Abdullah ibn Abbas That Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنهما 
he narrates, قال, كان عمر يدخلني مع أشياخ بدر. Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه, his practice was that he would include me in the Majlis al-Shura, in the cabinet, which was deciding the matters of the state for the entire Khilafah, along with the Ashyakh of Badr, meaning the great senior companions and shuyukh of the Sahaba, like Uthman bin Affan, Ali bin Abi Talib, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Zubair ibn al-Awam, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, Sa'id ibn Jubair, Sa'id ibn Zayd, these great Ashara, Mubashara, early predecessors, senior Sahaba, he, they would have a Majlis al-Shura where they were deciding matters of the state or the Muslim Ummah, and they were uh, far more senior to me. Remember, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was um, uh, not just a younger Sahabi, he was way younger, a uh, whole generation under them. At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa leaving this world, he was only 9 years or 11 years old. And we're just a few years ahead. After two and a half years of Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, if you're talking about if he was 9 years old, then uh, maybe 12 year old, 13 year old boy. He's joining this gathering of the shura, madlis al-shura, not of one masjid or one little community, but for the entire khilafah. So some of the mashayikh and the elder sahaba, they used to have an objection, uh, they used to feel uh, a little bit in their hearts that, uh, why is this young boy sitting with us? Why is this young boy sitting with us in this mashwara, very important gathering here, and we have kids who are his age. We have kids who are his age. Uh, so brother, I, I'm losing the sight of the brothers behind the pillar, so maybe I could see your beautiful faces. So, uh, wala, um, we can... Suleiman, bring a chair for the uncle. Bring a chair. Kursi lay. Take lay. Ne hamar talib lay lay. So uh, we have children his age. So Umar radiallahu anhu was very patient. He would be. He would keep on tolerating uh, the objections people were making. But one time he got too much. He got tired. Why? Uh, why are people objecting repeatedly about his selection? So this was not a meeting where people could come on their own accord and, and sit. This was a closed meeting. This was a meeting of, uh, of uh, the cabinet of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him he, with uh, great insight, great wisdom, subhanAllah. And it is something for us, all of us, and all students and seniors, everyone included, that we should study the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Shibli Nomani rahimullah has written a very beautiful work, Al Farooq. Uh, it's translated in English as well for those who cannot read Urdu. And it really uh, inspires a person. It fills up a person's heart with the love of our deen of Islam and with greatness and courage. Because afterwards, unfortunately, starting from the second half of the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the fighting and the civil wars, they, be they began with no end till today. So, it's very sad when you read our history. It makes a person feel so despondent. And, but the only part of the history where a person is encouraged and a person yeah, feels so happy to be belong to this ummah. And so thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And very positive uh, lessons that we can learn are from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naturally and the khilafah of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, khilafah of Umar radiallahu ta'ala So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the great wisdom that he was blessed with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that he could identify people who have talent. He had that hikmah and firasa. He could see who has talent and who has potential. And instead of blocking the, their progress, as we see in later kings, and squashing them because they could be potential rivals and become too famous, he would promote them further and utilize their skills. And with the youth, for example, these two names are very famous. We always talk about Muhammad ibn Qasim al thaqafi And... Uh, Tariq ibn Ziyad. Muhammad ibn Qasim Saqafi, uh, we say that, wow, he was only 17 years old. 17. 17 years he laid the foundation of the civilization of Islam in the East. Uh, when the one merchant ship was traveling in the ocean, and uh, we know Raja, the other from the Sindh province, his 
he, his, um, some of his people, they harassed one Muslim ship and some Muslim women, their honor was violated and they sent out a cry for help. And uh, the governor of Iraq at that time, Hajjaj bin Yusuf Thaqafi, which was critical is he didn't take mashwara from the capital. He didn't get permission from uh, the Khalifa in Dimashq. The Umavi Khalifa, Abdul Malik and Ahmed Marwan, and then his son Hisham bin Abdul Malik. Without taking permission, he sent his nephew, who Muhammad ibn Qasim, to go and take care of these people. And he went. Not only took care of them, he kept on progressing further and further, going east, all the way into present-day uh, uh, Baluchistan, from Baluchistan into Sindh, and from Sindh into Punjab, all the way up to Multan. And he conquered the east and took Islam all the way there, and he brought all of these lands into the fold of Islam. With much, uh, uh, with, the, with armies that were um, far greater in number, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him victory upon victory in the east. This is the story we always mention and inspire our youth. But then we don't mention what happened afterwards. We just stop there. Same thing exactly happened in the west. Is that Uqba ibn Nafi' uh, rahimullah, was the commander all the way to the western tip of North Africa. He took his soldiers, in, he took his horse into the Atlantic Ocean, where I had the opportunity to visit there. It's called the town of Asafi, my great sadness. When I visited there, I said, why does this town have such a sad name? Because I forgot what we had read in history. It did not click when I had the opportunity to go there for 40 days in the, uh, in the country of Morocco in 2000. Um, just a few years ago, I believe it was maybe 2007, I went there, or 2006. And... I, great sadness. Asafi means my great sadness. So I said the whole town has such a despondent, melancholy name, morbid name, my sadness. What great tragedy occurred here? Why is the whole town known as Asafi? Was there a great massacre or tragedy that occurred here? A great a, a sadness that has fallen on the entire city. That's the name of the city of sadness. They said, okay, we'll show you tomorrow why it's called sadness. The next day, if we, they took me to the beach. I said, why are we going to the beach? They said, wait. When he got to the beach, they said, this is the exact place where Uqba ibn Nafi, rahimahullah, he took his horse into the waves. And then he heaved a deep sigh and he said, Asafi, ya Asafi. Oh, my great sadness. This ayah is it's in the Quran too. When Yaqub al-Islam says, ya Safa ala Yusuf. Oh, my great sadness. I'm missing my son, Yusuf. So the same thing he said, ya Safi. Oh, my great sadness. He said, there is no more land to spread Islam. I was going west to west from... Egypt to uh, Libya, from Libya to Algeria, Algeria to Tunisia, Morocco, western tip of Morocco, he said, no more land. And he brought, took his horse as far as the waves, as far into the ocean he could go, and he said, Wallah, if I know there's a land beyond this ocean, I will definitely spread the banner of Islam there. So one of his young lieutenants was Tariq ibn Ziyad. He was 19 years old, whereas Muhammad ibn Qasim was 17. He was 19. And he took a, a small contingent of his uh, uh, companions, and he crossed the strait into the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain of today entered into Europe now. And the famous incident where he burned the ships. When he addressed his troops and he said that, what do you see below you on the, on the, uh, below the cliffs on the shore? Do you, what do you see there in the night? They saw the burning flames. He said, look, there is no way back. How, how many of you want to see your wives and your children? You want to see your homeland? The only way you're going to ever see your family again is, is by moving forward and gaining victory and then getting the means of returning back. That was the courage he had and he instilled that in his soldiers. And he went and he conquered the, uh, uh, what is today known as Spain and Portugal. But both of these young heroes, what happened to both of them? Both of them were arrested, put under house arrest. None of them received any medals or honors, but both of them were imprisoned for the rest of their lives from young age by the Khalifa in Damascus and were rotting in their homes. That who gave you permission to go conquer the East? Who gave you permission to go conquer the West? If they were unleashed and let... They, you know, uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Qasim would have gone all the way to Japan and maybe Muhammad, Tariq ibn Ziyad would have gone all the way to England whole Europe and Asia would have been covered by both of these young men but it's the jealousy of the Khalifa that oh these young boys are getting so out of hand too much power and they're becoming so great heroes what is going to happen to my throne and people will begin to uh, look up to them more than they're looking up to me so both of them were punished. This is the sad part we don't share, but it is a reality for us to see that how destructive jealousy and hasad can be. Has been and is today and will remain a destructive force. It is the first sin of Iblis, that the jealousy that 
expelled him from Jannah when he was jealous of Adam alayhi salam. In any case, Umar radiallahu anhu was not like that. He was the exact opposite. He would promote young people. So he realized that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma was gifted with a special gift, that he had the deep knowledge of tafsir. Despite being such a young boy, he is known as Hibr al-Ummah, the great scholar of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum with regards to tafsir. And he was tolerating the objections of the senior Sahaba. Why is this young boy here? I'm reading the narration from Bukhari, uh, Sahih Bukhari, uh, that, he, that they were objecting. We, he's the age of our kids, why is this young boy sitting here? So he said, okay, you know what? I, w- I will now make it uh, manifest and clear and evident to everybody why this young boy is here. فَدَعَاهُمْ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ فَأَدْخَلَنِي مَعَهُمْ Abdullah ibn Abbas says, one day he called the whole shura and then he called me in front of them. فَمَا رَأَيْتُ أَنَّهُ دَعَانِ فِيهِمْ يَوْمَ إِلَّا لِيُرِيَهُمْ I realized by the way he called me in front of everybody that today he wants to show them something about me. Because he brought me in with that type of mood he was in and he said, come sit here in front of everyone. فَقَالَ مَا تَقُولُونَ فِي قَوْلِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ so he asked all the senior sahaba, what is your opinion, what is the meaning of this surah, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ The surah we just read, the translation. What is the khulasa and the summary of this surah? What does this surah mean? فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ أَمَرَنَا أَنْ نَحْمَدُ اللَّهُ وَنَسْتَغْفِرَهُ إِذَا نَصَرَنَا وَفَتَحَ عَلَيْنَا The sahaba, the senior ones, they said, Allah is commanding us. Naturally, it's this very easy question. Allah is commanding us that we should praise Him and seek His forgiveness when He grants us victory and He and helps us. وَسَكَدَ بَعْضُهُمْ فَلَمْ يَقُلْ شَيْئًا Others were more wise, they remained silent. They said, no, there must be something beyond that. That's why he's asking us. They didn't say anything. فَقَالَ لِي أَكَذَلِكَ تَقُولُوا يَا بْنَ عَبَّاسِ Then he asked me, oh, Ibn Abbas, what is your opinion? Do you agree with these seniors? Is that the meaning of the surah? فَقُلْتُ لَا I said, no, that's not the meaning of the surah. The actual purpose of the surah is not just that when the help of Allah comes, you make istighfar. No, there's a deeper meaning. فَقَالَ مَا تَقُولُ Okay, young boy, what do you say? فَقُلْتُ هُوَ أَجَلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَلَّمْ أَعْلَمَهُ لَهُ I said, this surah is telling Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم that your time to return to Allah is drawn near and your life is now very short. Allah is informing him of his impending return. We read the translation. It's not there. You have to read sometimes between the lines or behind the lines even. فَقَالْ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصُرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ فَذَٰلِكَ عَلَامَةُ أَجَلِكَ Abdullah ibn Abbas said, when Allah said, when the help of Allah comes in victory, this is the sign that your end is near. And so Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu responded by saying, لَا أَعْلَمُ مِنْهَا إِلَّا مَا تَقُولُ I also know exa- uh, agree 100% with what you are saying. How did Abdullah ibn Abbas understand this? There's two things. Number one is, over here, when the help of Allah comes in victory, and you will see people entering the fold of Islam in great numbers, what does that mean? Your mission is now accomplished. You have done your job, you have done your duty. That's the first thing he saw. And then, the second thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ Seek forgiveness of Allah. When does a person seek forgiveness from Allah? When his amal is complete. When the amal is complete, when you finish your job, then you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness for whatever deficiencies are remaining. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَابًا So this, this surah was revealed, this is why the surah is known as surah tawdi'ah, the surah of bidding farewell. And it's indicating the approach of the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the last Complete surah to be revealed. Last, complete surah. There are few ayats which were revealed after this, but they are not. They are parts of bigger surahs. The last complete surah to be revealed was Surah Al-Nasr. Just like we say, the first complete surah to be revealed was Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha is the first complete surah. This does not uh, deny. We do not deny the fact that beginning ayats from Surah Al-Alaq were revealed before Fatiha. That's the first revelation. Iqra bismi Rabbika al-ladhi khalaq. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ اقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمُ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمُ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمُ Till there. First revelation. But not the entire surah. Then after that, what came? يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُزَّمِّلْ قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرْ 
beginning ayat, not the whole surah. Stand up and warn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the effort of the day, and stand in the night in ibadah, effort of the night. These two surahs are revealed. Then after that, the entire first surah complete to be revealed was surah al-Fatiha. Likewise, the last complete surah to be revealed was surah al-Nasr, surah al-Tawdi'ah, the surah of bidding farewell. Uh, this happened in the final hajj of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was performing his hajj in the Dhul Hijjah of the 10th year of Hijrah. Dhul Hijjah. Then after that is Muharram of the 11th year. Then Safar of the 11th year. Then Rabi'ul Awwal. In Rabi'ul Awwal, 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, Monday, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. So few weeks or few months before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. There is a detailed narration by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah in Qurtubi, in Tafsir Qurtubi, is, uh, narrates it, that this ayah was revealed, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ We have done this ayah before. Today I have perfected for you your religion, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen Islam as your deen. This ayah, third ayah from Surah Al-Ma'idah, this was revealed 80 days before Rasulullah sallam left this war. 80 days. And the countdown begins. And it's very... Uh, uh, precise, we can see that this ayah was revealed 80 days before Rasulullah the completion of the deen, well known ayah we have covered it several times and then uh, this ayah here, the last ayah from Surah Tawbah, 35 days 35 days left for the earthly existence of Rasulullah indeed, certainly there has come to you a messenger from amongst yourself azizun alayhi ma'anitum it is very grievous for him, he finds a great difficulty in pain to see you suffer. Harisun alaykum. He is haris, desirous and concerned for your goodness, for your well-being. Bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim. With the believers, he is kind and merciful. Fa'in tawallo. If they still turn their backs, faqul hasbi Allah. Say, O my Nabi, Allah is sufficient for me. Alayhi tawakkalt. On him do I rely. Wa huwa rabbul arushil azim. He is the Lord of the greatest throne. 35 days left. And then, final, last absolute last ayah that revealed by Allah upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this is uh, after many opinions the opinion that uh, Jalaluddin Suyuti rahmatullahi has given preference to and al-itqan fi ulum al-Qur'an wattaqu yawman turja'una fihi ila Allah fear the day when you shall be returned to Allah thumma tuwaffa kullu nafsin ma kasabat then every soul shall be compensated by Allah what they have earned وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ They will not be treated unjustly. Absolute akhri ayat. Do Abdullah Sallam per Nazil This is the final ayat that was revealed upon Rasulullah Sallam. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayat 281. After this ayat, Jibreel Sallam never came down and never will come down with any wahi. The Mubarak Sallam which began from Adam and Nuh alayhi wasalam, terminated on this ayah. And that is why Ummah Iman radiallahu anha who did the khidmah of Rasulullah Sallam for 63 years when Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah they said let's go visit her. She is the one who took care of Rasulullah Sallallahu from his birth, the slave girl of his mother Amina, all throughout his life. And Rasulullah Sallallahu used to visit her like a mother. Let's go visit her. And she was crying. She said, I'm not crying because Rasulullah Sallallahu has passed away. I'm crying because the wahi has now terminated for once and all. This is the last ayah. So this was right before these few ayats that I mentioned here was a Surah Al-Nasr, the last complete surah that was revealed. So one point is that uh, how did Abdullah bin Abbas ta'ala understand this? It is because he saw that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking Rasulullah to make istighfar, seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he knows that the wadifa of istighfar, the obligation of seeking forgiveness is at the end of the amal. This is borne out by many ayats in the Quran. This is one ayah from Surah Al-Mu'minun. Surah 23, Ayah 60. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا And those who they give and they do what they do. They give what they give. It's very ambiguous. They give. Do they do you give good things or bad things? We don't know. يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا They give what they give. And after they do what they do and they give what they give. It doesn't mean positive or negative. We don't know. What happens after that? وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ Then their hearts are fearful. أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ that they will be returning to their Lord. So what does this ayah mean? It's very uh, uh, confusing. So that is why in Sahih Bukhari, the narration is that Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, knowing the Arabic language, in her home the Quran was revealed, being the greatest uh, scholar from amongst the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu She was also confused, and she asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, is this ayah revealed about those people? 
يصلون ويصومون ويتصدقون they fast they give sadaqa and they give zakah and sadaqa and they fast and perform salah they do righteous actions and then their hearts no she asked this, uh, this I heard feel sorry about those people yes uh, who alladheena uh, yasraqoon those who steal ويشربون الخمور they drink alcohol and they commit all kinds of sins then their hearts tremble in fear that we have to return to our Lord because then they make Tawbah they say oh we have committed all these sins right? this is what so this the, the, they give what they give she took it in a negative sense they, they do bad things they commit sins this is what naturally anybody would think because after they're committing their sins then their hearts are fearful they make Tawbah that we will be returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you follow? Everyone follows that. This is what Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha understood. The people who steal, plunder, drink alcohol, commit fornication, and after committing all of these sins, then their hearts tremble in fear, we have to return to Allah. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, absolutely wrong. La ya Aisha. No way. This ayah is revealed about those people, which I said earlier. Yasumun wa yasaddaqun, wa yasaddaqun wa yasaddaqun. They perform salah, give sadaqah, and they fast. They do righteous deeds. After doing righteous deeds, then their hearts are fearful and they make toba to Allah. Oh Allah, is their action worthy of acceptance or not? After committing the good deeds, then they make toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the next ayah. Allah ta'ala, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, look at the context. See, that was 2360, 60th ayat of Surah Al-Mu'minun, the 61st ayah. fil khayrat. These are the ones who hasten to do good deeds. Wahum laha sabiqun. And they outstrip others. They, they go ahead of others. They have sabqat le wale. They go ahead of everyone else. So this is the quality of the mu'min. The mu'min is the one who does the good deed and he makes istighfar. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he completed the salah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is Sayyidul Abideen, Sayyidul Arifin, the one whose ibadah is at the highest level, whose ibadah is the standard for everyone else. After completing the best form of worship, salah, then he would say, Astaghfirullah, 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 three times. We know that, right? Kana yastaghfirullah thalasan. After finishing salah, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Then he would say, Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Istighfar kis baat? Why are you making istighfar? Did you lie? Did you cheat somebody? Did you, what did you do? No, I performed salah, I'm making istighfar. Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa had the realization that there's no way we can fulfill the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being the highest level, having, you know, yani, his ibadah was the best ibadah ever possible. Yet he was the most humble at the same time. Because he had in front of him the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is a question that we need to ponder and reflect over. When the, and no one salah, no wali, no, no sahib al-karama, no wali of Allah, and no sahabi, no tabi'i, ever can equal the ibadah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his ibadah was at the pinnacle of perfection. And at the same time, he regarded it as the most ins- insignificant. He looked down upon it that he did not count anything. In fact, he said to Allah, ما عبدناك حق عبادتك. Oh Allah, I cannot worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped. So how was he at the same time the greatest and at the same time the most humble? It might seem like a dichotomy, like a, a two opposites. How can he maintain both feelings at the same time? The answer to this riddle is because uh, he was most aware of the greatness of Allah. So no matter how great he was becoming, in front of him was the greatness of Allah. He had the greatest ibadah. He was Sayyidul Arifin at the same time. He had the most ma'rifah of Allah. And Allah is infinite in his being, in his sifat, in his zat, in his sifat. So he was comparing his ibadah to the infinite Allah. And when he was comparing his finite ibadah to the infinite Allah, he realized that finite, no matter how billion, trillion, zillion it may become, compared to infinity, mathematically, it's equivalent to zero. It's nothing. And what's the problem with us is that our ibadah is so full of holes, but we do not have the ma'rif of Allah. So we are thinking we have fulfilled the haqq of Allah, fulfilled the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why we magnify our own ibadah. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Dhariyat, this is of the keys and the hints for Abdullah bin Abbas, how he understood this. إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ Verily, the righteous will be among gardens and springs. آخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ They are going to be accepting what their Lord has given them. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مُحْسِنِينَ Before they were doers of good, they were doing ihsan. What is ihsan? كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْنِ مَا يَحْجَعُونَ very short portions of the night they used to sleep. Meaning majority of the night what they were doing, this is the balagh of the Qur'an. You have to fill in the blanks. Very small portion of the night they were sleeping, doesn't mean most of the night they were playing video games or playing carom board, watching you know, movies. What it means is majority of the night they were standing in, ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
وَبِلْ أَسْحَارِ In Sahur, what is Sahur? The dawn. The morning time, هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ They are asking forgiveness. Majority of the night in Ibadah, yet in the morning asking istighfar. Why are they asking istighfar? They are saying, Wallah, we do not worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped. That's why our elders say when you come back from Jawla, what do you go? What do you do on the way back? You make istighfar. Because oh Allah, we did not fulfill the right of the da'wah. This is the work of the Anbiya salam. At the completion of the amal, make istighfar. Wa'idhirfa'u Ibrahim wal qawaida min al bayt. Remember when Ibrahim was raising the foundations of Baytullah, Surah Al Baqarah, Ayah 127, 128. And Ismail, his son. They said, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Lord, accept this action from us. Inna ka anta samiul alim. You are the all hearing, all knowing. You hear our du'as, you know our condition. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ O oh Allah, make us true Muslims. وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ And from our progeny, a ummah which will be a Muslim ummah. وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا Teach us the knowledge of how to perform hajj in the correct manner. Show us our rights. وَتُوبَ عَلَيْنَا O oh Allah, accept our repentance. قُنْ سَا غُنَاكَ كَامْ كَا بَيْتُ اللَّهِ كِتَامِيرِ They build the house of Allah, and yet they're saying, O oh Allah, accept our repentance. Because they finished building the Baytullah. So after the amal is complete, make istighfar. This can, we can continue this topic. There's so many ahadith about it as well. Inna kanta tawabu rahim. You are the one who accepts tawbah and you're the merciful. So all of these ayats prove the same thing. All the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu When Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Oh Rasulullah, alimni du'a'an. Teach me a dua. I will make this dua at the end of my salah. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching the Siddiq, Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathira. Oh Allah, I have wronged myself a great wrong. I've done the biggest zulm to myself. By what? By performing the ibadah in the way I performed it. And no one can forgive the sins besides you. I ask from you a special forgiveness. Warhamni and showery mercy. This is dua masura, right? And attahiyat, we say attahiyatu lillah. Then we say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad. Then we make this dua, right? We should be making this dua. This is a dua to make in the salah. So, uh, now going back in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said here, this is the key word, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ Seek His forgiveness. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا How did Abdullah ibn Abbas gain this knowledge when all the other seniors did not? The story behind that is that he got the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like our elders used to say, ek kisi se dua mangna, ek dua lena. One is to ask for dua, one is to spontaneously get the dua from the heart of your elders, your parents, your teachers, your mashayikh. <coughs> So Abdullah ibn Abbas, being a very young boy, uh, he had so much desire to learn about the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu that he asked his parents, Abbas and Umm al-Fadl radiallahu anhuma, that can I go sleep over at my khala's house? His khala. And this, he, he didn't randomly ask to sleep over at his khala house any night. He asked a specific date. On that date, can I leave home and go sleep at my khala's house? My maternal aunt. So they, they said, okay, fine. I mean, just... You can sleep there. But which khala and which night? It was his khala, Maymuna, radiallahu anha. And which night? He waited on the calendar. He went investigations. He made which is the day of Rasulullah, sallallahu when he's with Aisha, then Hafsa, then Sa'udah, you know, all the different wives. When is the date that Rasulullah, sallallahu is going to be sleeping at Maymuna, radiallahu anha's house? So he planned that from before. And he, he did not go there with intention to sleep. He went there. This is now, remember when, Rasul, when he passed away, he was 11 years old. Maybe he's a 9-year-old boy, 8-year-old boy, 7-year-old boy. We don't know how he, when this exact happened. But it happened, of course, when Rasulullah was still alive. So he, we know that it was before he was 9. 9 or before. 9 or younger. So he goes and his whole intention is to stay awake and observe. You know, just like uh, people have different problems and then we had the sleep centers where we go to the sleep center and we book in like a hotel and you sleep overnight and they observe you, how you're sleeping. The sleep medicine is a whole all right, branch of medicine nowadays. <coughs> so he went for the sleep study of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And there are so many different ahadith we know about how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made the dua after hajjah. Uh, you know, if you open Sahih Bukhari, you'll find a narration that and when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the time of the Hajjud, he used to make the dua, inna fi khalqi samawati wa ardi till the end. He recited these ayat. It's just, we just look at it and we say, oh, it's narrated by Abdullah bin Abbas. But we never realize that how does he know? And how did he narrate it to us? It is because he was doing the sleep study. The whole night he was staying awake and he was observing and he heard 
that this is the dua Rasulullah sallallahu made at tahajjud and that is why he preserved that knowledge and information and transmitted it to the entire ummah for us to follow. So that night when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa woke up, he saw that a fresh miswak was pre- pre- prepared for him and there was water that had been taken out of the well and brought in the vessel. It was ready for him to make wudu. So he looked at it and he was uh, uh, surprised because he was going to go do his own khidmah. As it comes in the hadith, kana yakhdimu nafsahu. He would do his own service. He would take care of his own needs at home. He wouldn't demand khidmah. Of course, that doesn't mean the wives who shouldn't take this out of context is not to serve their husbands. It's a great reward for the wife to serve the husband. And they used to go out of their way to serve Rasulullah sallallahu Which wife of Rasulullah sallallahu did not want to serve him? But beyond his needs that they fulfilled, if he, there was something he could do for himself, he would also do. So it's balance on both sides. The husbands should try to help themselves and uh, not put undue burden on their wives, but the wives should also try to uh, serve their husbands and gain the pleasure and reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he used to serve his own self, but what happened is the water was already ready, the miswak was ready. So what happened is he was naturally surprised. He was happy. He said, who brought this? And then Abdullah bin Abbas, who you know, emerged from the shadows and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm, I'm here. I did brought that for you, so it's ready for you to make the hajjud. Because he did not sleep. He was staying up all night, like young kids stay up for other purposes nowadays, unfortunately. Playing all night, but he was staying awake, watching Rasulullah sallallahu So then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was so happy with his khidmah, with the khidmat se dua milti, as they say. Through the khidmah, you gain the dua. He made the dua. It came out of his heart. Allahumma faqihu fi deen. O oh Allah, grant this young boy the understanding of the deen. Wa'allimhu ta'weel. And grant him special knowledge of tafsir. Because of this dua, we see this young boy in the surah of Umar radiallahu an, is telling all the senior sahaba, this is the meaning of this surah. And then he further mentioned the hadith, that when this surah was revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi recited it to all the companions, and everyone was smiling and shaking hands, and congratulating one another, hugging one another, wow, the help of Allah is coming, the victory is coming. And only Abu Bakr and my father Abbas were crying. And why are they were crying? Because they also understood the reality of what this surah means. Subhanallah. I'm going back to the first uh, ayah here. Going back over the words. Uh, when will come Nasrullah, the help of Allah. This is the key word here. Nasr is the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has attributed it to himself. The Nasr of Allah. The help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The help that will come for the Ummah has come in the past, will come today. If we uh, earn it and will ever come, it is, it'll come only from Allah. The help cannot come from any other makhluk. All the makhluk put together cannot help anyone. This is something which we have to believe in. And this is the greatest test that we have as an Ummah. Is to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the musabbiqul asbab. And all the means of victory and help only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's one ayah to remind us about this that I wanted to share with you. Uh, look at this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lillahi al-amru, in Surah Al-Rum in the beginning. Lillahi al-amru min qablu min ba'd. To Allah belongs the command in all affairs. Before your victory, after your victory. When you are maghloob, when you are overtaken by enemy, when you are victorious now. In all conditions, the matter lies in the hands of Allah. When, Allah, when you were being whipped and destroyed, and when you were being tortured in the valleys of Makkah, it was all matters in Lillahi al-Amr. It was in the control of Allah. When you are now victorious and you rule over the Arabian Peninsula, it's always in the hands of Allah. يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ And on that day, the believers, they will rejoice in the victory of Allah. The victory is from Allah. بِنَصْرِ And Allah says, يَنْصُرُوا مَنْ yasha." He grants a victory to whomsoever he wills. The victory lies in the hands of Allah and he is the one who will give it to whom he wills whenever he wills in whichever way he wills. He is the one who exalted in might, he is merciful. Allah. This is the promise of Allah. Allah has promised a victory if you will obey him, if you will have iman and do the work of the anbiya, the work of da'wah, the work of establishing the deen of Allah, the promise of the help of Allah is there. It was there in the past, it's there today. Allah has not changed. لا يخلف الله وعدا. Allah will never fail in His promise. Who has changed? We have changed. ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. Most of the people they do not know. 
they do not know this reality. What do they know? يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They know only the zahir, the apparent of the worldly life. Not even the haqiqah of the worldly life, only the apparent illusion, they are all uh, in the deception of the worldly life. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِرُونَ Pertaining to the hereafter, they are absolutely unaware. They are in ghafla. So the reality is the help comes from Allah. The nusra comes from Allah. From no other side can we look for nusra and help. And if you're looking to help from other nations, from United Nations, from the World Bank, from the Food Bank, from this bank, and IMF and International Monetary Fund, that they are going to help us in our Muslim countries. We need the loans from them. They are, we are further being enslaved by these other powers. We have to look for the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the only one who grants granted victory. This is the first word here. I want to go back to the ayah to show us so we can concentrate. Nasrullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the help of Allah will come. The help only comes from Allah. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was fully aware of that. When the help of Allah comes, wal fatah and the victory. Which is the victory referred to here? All the scholars of tafsir agree. This is referring to the victory of Makkah. Fathu Makkah. The conquest of Makkah. And this was a great victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Eight years ago, Nabi Wasallam had left this Makkah, the land of his birth, the birthplace, his hometown, and uh, the place that he loved so dearly, he left it crying in tears. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised him. When he had left, uh, we know he went south, the opposite direction of Medina. He went the opposite direction to the Ghar of Thawr and hid for three days. And then he made a bypass around Makkah and he came back towards north, going north towards Medina. And when he came onto the main road, he looked back and he saw the road going towards Makkah and he cried. And he said, Oh, Allah, oh Makkah, in, Ya Makkah, inna ki bil biladi layya. You are the most beloved portion of the earth to me. Minki ma minki qattu. If it wasn't that the people of Makkah had expelled me from you, then I would never leave you. But he was crying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah. Inna alladhi farda alayka al-Qur'an laradduka ila ma'ad. That Allah who has revealed the Qur'an upon you, He promises that He shall allow you to return. To give the courage to Rasulullah Wasallam to continue. So after facing the attacks in Badr and Wahad and Khandaq, and then finally trying to make the Umrah in the sixth year and being turned back in Hudaybiyah, at that juncture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed the ayah, inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. We are going to grant you a great open victory. The terms that are being signed are so one-sided and so difficult and it seems that it is uh, just loss and very open, blatant loss that they have come all the way to make Umrah and they're being turned back. They came with no intention of any aggression, with no uh, extra arms, just one sword each that a person would carry when he would go out in that day and age because of all the dangers of the desert. And they are being turned back and said, no, you cannot come and do Umrah. You cannot make tawaf of Baytullah and sign these terms in which it was any Muslim who accepts Islam from Makkah must be returned to Makkah. But any Muslim from Medina goes back towards Makkah and becomes a murtad, uh, he will be granted a safe refuge in Makkah. And all of these difficult terms. Um, and there will be a 10-year non-aggression pact. No war will take place for the next 10 years. So when this pact was signed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah upon Rasulullah There's a great victory hidden in there for you. And that is the whole lesson of Sirah, how within short span of two years, the Quraysh themselves broke the pact and opened the doors for Rasulullah to go and conquer Makkah. And Rasulullah entered Makkah to Mukarramah with 10,000 Sahaba. And when he enters into Makkah, he enters as a conqueror, as a Fatih, with absolutely no opposition. Yet we find the humbleness in Rasulullah that his forehead was bowed down so much that his forehead was touching the neck of the qaswa cam of his camel qaswa and what was on his tongue alhamdulillahi wahda all praise and thanks to allah alone anjaza wa'da he is the one who has fulfilled his promise making nisbah and attribution everything back to allah nasara abda he helped his slave i am his slave he has helped his slave wa hazama al ahzaba wahda he is the one who has alone wahdahu alone he is the one who has vanquished all of the enemy all of the groups ahzab are all the different troops and all the different tribes and all the different enemies. He is the one who has vanquished them. So, this is all under the word I'm saying, Nasrullah. Remember, the help comes from Allah alone. 
Every single battle the Sahaba won, they were far inferior to the opposition. The one single battle in the seer of Rasulullah where they outnumbered the opposition was in the battle of Hunayn. After this Fatih Makkah 10,000, another 2,000 Makkans added, became 12,000. And the opposition of the Banu Hawazin were fewer in number, far fewer. This was the first time, 313 versus 1,000 in Badr. They destroyed them. 70, shaheed, 70 of them were killed, not shaheed, sent to Jahannam. And 70 were captured. Likewise in uh, Uhud, it was 1,000 Sahaba left, 300 Munafiqeen went back, 700 remained versus thousands. Same thing in, in the Khandaq, in the Battle of the Ditch. What, there were 3,000 Sahaba, thousands, several, 10,000 or so different tribes, the Quraysh as well as different Ghassan, etc. had joined in the Battle of Ahzab, the Battle of the Different Tribes, the Battle of the Ditch. So they were always inferior. Now they were 12,000 in number. So they said that لَن نُغْلَبْ الْيَوْمْ عَنْ قِلَّةٍ We will never be defeated today because of small numbers. We are so big. Can you believe it? We are entering with 12,000 people and the opposition is so few. So what happened? As they were traveling, they had to pass through one very, very narrow ravine. It becomes a very narrow place. And uh, you had to enter with few people at a time. All the 12,000 is great, but you can't enter 12,000. Only a few, few at a time can enter, and you had to pass through. You can't go both sides. It's steep, unpassable mountains in a small little canyon in between. And there was bush on both sides. So these archers, they were hiding, and the Banu Saqif were the best archers of Arabia. They were hiding. Few of them, but they were hiding in the position. They had a very advantageous position. And when the Sahaba were going through that valley, they started shooting the arrows. And many Sahaba, they, they, became over, they uh, were overcome by fright, and they turned their back and started retreating. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah in Surah Al-Tawbah. لَقَدَ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَوَاطِنَ كَثِيرًا Allah has come to your help in many different battles. وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ Remember the day of Hunayn. إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ When you were very pleased by your kathra, by your numbers, you said, oh, we are so many today. And فَلَمْ يُغْنِ عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا It did not help you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your, your great numbers did not come to your aid. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ all the earth became so tight for you, even though you're so vast, it became tight. Then you turn your backs and started running. Everyone, a lot of them started running back. And this is one of the examples where we give of the courage of Rasulullah Of course, he never turned his back ever. And he continued to move forward on his uh, mule. And uh, Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah was holding him from the front and calling out uh, loudly as he had a a loud voice. They are Ansar, Ya Muhajirin, where are you turning your back? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proclaimed, I am the Nabi I am the Nabi of Allah, not a false prophet. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib, the leader of the Quraysh. Where are you guys going? And then the Ansar Muhajirin, they heard his call and they came back. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reminds us that the help is not in numbers, it's not in arms, it's not in anything. The help comes directly from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's the key word, Nasrullah as uh, something for us to remember. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the victory uh, on the hands of Rasulullah and the hands of the Sahaba, this is an honor, takrim from Allah on his Rasul and on his Ashab, on his companions, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the victory to occur on their hands. And this is why when a person is blessed in our, in our, our own personal lives, in our short, small victories that we have at work, and we are progressing, we are getting a raise, a higher position, or whatever the case may be, then when this victory occurs, this happiness, this prosperity that we are enjoying, if we recognize this comes from Allah, then instead of having kibber and arrogance, we will have more shukr of Allah. That's why, فَيَدِبُ التَّسْبِيحُ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارُ We should ask Allah for forgiveness and continue to engage in the tasbih. So, Fatah is referring to victory. The second thing is, وَرَأَيْتَ nas, And you will see the people entering the deen of Allah in great numbers. So how did this happen? This happened because 13 years in Makkah, very few people accepted Islam. Very difficult time of struggle. After the, uh, coming to Medina, only the Ansar of Medina accepted Islam. Where else did Islam spread? Outside? First year, Hijra, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, not much going on. Outside. Sixth year, after Hudaybiyah, 
the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, then the Sahaba had peace. They could travel outside. Before, they could not travel outside because of the constant war. And a lot of people started accepting Islam from the sixth year to the eighth year. But even that curve, and there's a whole reason behind that. Ibn Shahabuddin Zuhri, one of the great scholars from the among the Tabi'een, he says that why did the rate of people entering Islam go up after Treaty of Hudaybiyah? It is because the other tribes, they didn't have an opportunity to mix with the Sahaba because of constant war. But now they had trade and peace and prosperity, so they could go and trade and meet other people. And then the other tribes, they had the opportunity to experience firsthand who these people are, who are the Sahaba. And they started accepting Islam. But at the same time, a lot of people were waiting on the fence. Uh, they were saying that, okay, there's a power uh, of uh, shirk. The capital of shirk is in, Ka in Mecca, the old school of mushrikeen. And then there's a new religion, the people live in Medina. In Badr, the people in Medina won. In Uhud, the people of Mecca won. In Khanda, the people of Medina won. So sometimes they're winning, sometimes they're winning. Let's see who wins. And let us put, uh, join with the winning side. So there are people waiting on the fence, watching. The, it is mentioned in the books of Tafsir that uh, they actually said that in Fataha ala qumi, if he wins uh, and re, uh, if he retakes Makkah and if he conquers the Quraysh, this Muhammad sallallahu in Zahara ala qumihi fa huwa nabiyun. If he uh, beats his own people and he conquers Makkah, then he's a true nabi. Let's wait and see what happens. So after the conquest of Makkah, after the eighth year, then a lot of the tribes who uh, were doubtful. Now they, they said, okay, let's join the winning side. Likewise, there were other tribes who knew, they felt that Rasulullah brought the, has brought the true religion. But what, what happened is they were afraid. Uh, they don't want to mess up their relationships with the Quraysh. And, and they were scared of the Quraysh. And now that final obstacle has also been removed. So then they started entering into Islam in large numbers. But can they ever be equal? They can never be equal. This is the ayah I wanted to share with you from Surah Al-Hadid. This is the ayah here. Surah Al-Hadid, Surah 57, ayah number 10. لا يستوي منكم Never can be equal amongst you. من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل Those who spent in the path of Allah and they fought in the path of Allah before the قبل الفتح, before the فتح مكة. Why? Because difficult times. They were the ones who struggle in the difficult times. They are far greater in rank, in degree. Than those who spent afterwards in the path of Allah and fought in the path of Allah after Fatih Makkah. Now somebody might think, uh, wow, so those who came after Fatih Makkah, they are not at the, uh, they're not the same level. Do, are they guaranteed Jannah as well? Allah Ta'ala says, وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى To all Allah has promised, Al Husna, the best reward. Al Husna here, all the Mufassirun, all the scholars of Tafsir have ijma in consensus. Al Husna is referring to Al Jannah. All of them, Allah has promised Al Husna, Al Jannah. Meaning those who accepted Islam before Fatih Makkah, those who accepted Islam after the conquest of Makkah. As long as they were Sahaba, Allah has promised for both groups a Jannah. Wallahu bima ta'amaluna khabir. Allah is fully aware of what you do. But the distinction is there, they can never be equal. And this is a good reminder for us that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu said when basically is when it's difficult. When it was difficult to accept Islam, they accepted Islam. Yeah, so their rank is far higher. At the same time, uh, those who come at the end of time, it will be difficult as well. So their rank is also high in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Bada al-Islam wa gharibah wa sayyaudu gharibah. Islam began as a very strange religion. And time will come when it will again be regarded as a strange religion. Fatuba lil ghuraba. So congratulations and great blessings in Jannah for those who are considered strange by others. Those who are holding fast onto my sunnah at the time of the corruption of my ummah. So in the beginning, those few pioneers who accepted Islam and their uh, pledged allegiance on the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu and they struggled with him in the difficult times, their rank is far higher. And then those who just said, you know, we're going to throw in our lot with the winning side, their rank is also, they grant Jannah as well, but can never, they can never equal those. And those who are practicing the deen of Islam now, like holding on to a live burning charcoal, they will receive great reward. Adur khamsin, they will receive the reward of 50. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, 50 of them or 50 of us? He said, 50 of you. Those who will hold on to the Sunnah at the time of difficulty, they will receive the reward of 50 Sahaba. 
So this is uh, uh, an explanation of uh, the phenomena of waraita and nas. You will see the people entering the fold of Islam in large numbers. So that is why after the Fatih Makkah, the year is known as the ninth year. is known as the year of the year of delegations, Amul Wufud. Delegations meaning before Rasulullah SAW was going out inviting people, he didn't have to anymore. All the different tribes are coming to Medina. They're sending delegations. Wafdu Abdul Qais, all these different tribes are coming. In the hadith you'll see, oh, the tribe of Abdul Qais came, the tribe, this tribe came, that tribe came. The leaders, they come. And they're vying with one another, they are rushing with one another that we want to go and pay our homage and respect to this new leader, the United Leader of Arabia. We want to be on his good side. We want to get it, gain his favor. We want to enter into alliance with him. We want to show our allegiance to him because he is now the undisputed leader of Arabia. So all the tribes are pouring into Medina. One after another, they're accepting Islam. And you will see the people entering into Islam in large numbers. So, this was the, uh, go back to the surah inshallah. So what should you do after that? Now look at the words. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ Rabbik. So therefore make this, um, three things you have to receive. One is subhanallah, then one is alhamdulillah, and one is astaghfirullah. Three commands. فَسَبِّحْ, make the tasbih, along with bi hamdi, along with the hamd of your Lord, and seek His forgiveness. These three commands were given to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The hadith mentioned, Umm Salma radiallahu ta'ala anha mentions that Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam excessively started reciting after the revelation of this ayah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Sabbih bihamdi rabbik. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Then astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. And he was asked, why are you making this new dua, new tasbih? After every salah, in the morning, in the evening, all the times, continually, for the fa- last few days of his life, he repeatedly said this, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. So he said, Umirtu, I have been ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and he said, Inna rabbi kana akhbarani anni sa'ara alamatan fi ummati. My Lord had commanded me that I shall see a sign in my ummah. I shall see a sign in my ummah, an alama. Wa amarni idha ra'aytuha an usabbih bihamdi wa astaghfiruhu. Innahu kana tawaba. And he had commanded me that when I see this sign, then I should make tasbih along with hamd and istighfar. Verily, he is the one who accepts the tawbah. Faqad ra'aytuha, and I have seen it now. I have seen the sign. Therefore, I am fulfilling the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and likewise, Umm Salma, his wife, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates slightly different wording. Subhanaka Rabbana wa bihamdik, Allahum maghfirli. Same thing. Subhanallah and alhamdulillah is there, and Allahum maghfirli istighfar is there. But the gist of both is the same. And this is something which our scholars say that when approach of death is sensed, when a person is, you know, uh, the doctors, they say that, uh, you know, we have given up everything. Right? The doctors say, we give up, now it lies in the hands of God. You know, so who, whose hand? Lillahi al-amru, we just did it. It always was in the hands of God, before and after. But when, uh, when we finally give up hopes of life, or we are somebody, may Allah protect anyone. <coughs> Actually, this is something which is a blessing in disguise. If a person is diagnosed with eternal disease and he knows that he is going to die soon, and he, but he has some time. If you think about it, it's a blessing. Because we have been, sought, we have been asked to seek refuge from uh, death, uh, 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 which is uh, out of a calamity. Sudden death. Sudden death, a person doesn't have opportunity to prepare. But if a person is diagnosed with uh, uh, you know, stage 4 terminal cancer, and he, has, and he knows that his, he, you know, they're saying spread to several organs, and um, it's really... There's no point of even doing chemotherapy or, you know, or anything at this point. Um, even radiation therapy won't help. Even surgery, what's the point? It's like everywhere, spread everywhere. So this is just a few, t- few, few weeks, few, Allah alam, how much time is left. If that is told to us, then this is a mercy in disguise. Why? Because now you really know and you, it's, uh, it's going to come anyway. Everyone has to die. But now it becomes much more real for that person. And that vision he has at that time is that true, clear vision. 
He realizes how temporary everything is. So he can make the will that everyone should be making that will, but we never get around to making that will. He has the opportunity to make the will. He has the opportunity to make wasiyah to his children. He has the opportunity to close up all his affairs. He has the opportunity to fulfill the rights of Allah, fulfill the rights of the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds me of one of our shaykhs, Shaykh Suleiman al barakatuh or teacher of Sahih Muslim. Uh, he was advising the students. He was saying that uh, you do not have to be, uh, you know, be fasting on Mondays and Thursdays and your tahajjud and all these nawafil that you're engaged in, some of them. Most important thing is stop the ma'asiyah, stop sinning. Why are you engaged in so much sin? You're doing all the nawafil and you're committing sins. And then he said, this is the order of Allah. وَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّسْ the, the blessings of your Lord, you should mention it. So keeping this eye in mind, disclaimer, because of what he's going to say next. He said, تَحْدِيثًا bin نِعْمَةِ Because Allah said, you can mention the blessings of your Lord. I can say that I don't have much tahajjud, I don't have enough al and so on and much extra nawafil. But since I became baligh, I never missed a single farz salah. I never missed a single fast. I never borrowed five cents from anybody. Allah I have fulfilled to the best of my ability. Hukul ibadah I have fulfilled to the best of my ability. I'm ready to meet my Allah. Anytime Allah calls me, I'm ready. I'm looking forward when Allah is going to call me. That is what you need. Fulfill the obligations and abstain from his disobedience. This is the bottom line. So in any case, when we a person knows that his death is near, then he should engage in this specific tasbih. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. If you look at the words, first word is Subhanallah. Second is Alhamdulillah. And all the time, whenever we make any tasbih, whether it's what is commonly known as the third kalima, it's always first Subhanallah, then it's Alhamdulillah. And over here, it's Sabih Bihamdi Rabbik as well. First tasbih, then tahmid. Why? The order is, the logic behind it is that tasbih is tanzih of Allah. Tasbih means, in over here, it's translated as glorify or celebrate the praise of your Lord. What does that mean? What does glorify mean? Tasbih, literally in deeper meaning of tasbih is declaring the purity of Allah. Paak hai Allah, paak hai Allah ki zat, subhanallah. Paaki, paaki from what? Pure from what? Purifica- purifying, declaring the purity of Allah from all that which does not befit him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from many things which are, would be considered a defect for us. Allah is pure from what? Injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from committing oppression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from decrease in any of his powers. Allah is pure from nuqsan and zawal, from decrease. Right. But beyond that, Allah is pure from many things which uh, we as makhluk have. Allah is pure from being confined to time and space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure from having a beginning. Allah is pure from having an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is The first without a beginning, the end, last without an end. So he is pure from having a taste or a color or a weight. Any of these dimensions, he is the creator of time and space and he is not confined by time and space. So this is the subhanallah, declaring the purity of Allah. This is the first step. The second is alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is declaring, uh, attributing all the beautiful sifat to Allah. Even in tazkiyat nafs in, in rectification of the heart, in tasawwuf, the bashayikh, they mention the purification of the heart is two steps. One is called takhliya, one is called tahliya. Takhliya means to remove the razail and the, sick, and the sicknesses of the heart. And then tahliya is to adorn the heart with the beautification of hilwian means jewelry, all the beautiful attributes. So first a person has to work hard on the heart, remove hasad, jealousy, remove kibber, arrogance, remove hubbul dunya, love of dunya, hubbul jah, love of power. Love of power is different from love of wealth, the two different sicknesses. And all of the various sicknesses of the heart, greed, hypocrisy, then after removing that, adorn the heart. With what? With love of Allah, love of Akhirah, zuhud, taqwa, tawadur, humility, sabr, and shukr, rada bil qada, contentment with the order of Allah, decree of Allah. All of these beautiful attributes. And the example they give is, for uh, a physical mundane example of this world is, first you remove, the bride is prepared, she, the dirt and the grime and the, and the dirt, and um, the impurities are removed. Takhliya, remove the impurities. Then, the adornment with the makeup and the jewelry and the beautiful uh, uh, ornaments. That's called tahliya. Likewise here with respect to Allah, first we say subhanallah. Allah is pure from all defects. Remove all the defects from Allah. In our, in our mind we are removing that 
declaring the purity of Allah from all the defects. After doing that, then we say, Alhamdulillah, we attribute all the beautiful qualities to Allah, of justice, of being ma'bud al-haqiqi, of being the true word, uh, object of worship, of being the khariq and the malik, of being the raziq, of being samir and basir, all hearing, all knowing, all seeing, all hearing, and alim and khabir, all the attributes of Allah, we attribute it to Him. That's why first subhanallah, then alhamdulillah. All the du'as we'll find that subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanallah, alazim. First subhanallah, then alhamdulillah. And then what's the fear? Ask His forgiveness. Ask forgiveness that this is the, the wilifa, not only when a person is enjoying a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, uh, not only when a person is near death, but when he enjoys any blessing from Allah, we should say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, and astaghfirullah. Making, asking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for not fulfilling the haqq of shukr. Even the way we make istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the way we make istighfar, we have to ask Allah istighfar for how we are making istighfar. And innahu kana tawaba. Tawab. Tawba is what does tawba mean? Tawba means to what direction a person is going to make a 180 degree turn and, and return back. So this verb is very interesting because the banda, the slave of Allah, also makes tawba, and there is a tawba that Allah Ta'ala does. But it's a different tawba. The tawba that we do is that tab al abdu tab Allah. The tawba of a slave is that he is running away from Allah in his sin in Masiya. He makes a 180 degree turn and he returns back to Allah. That act of returning back to Allah is called Tawbah. Alright, the time for, we are finishing. Uh, the time for Tawbah is when a person returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns back to his slave by accepting his Tawbah. That's why I wanted to explain what is this word Tawwaba, often returning. It really does not give justice to the word Tawwab. Tawwab is the one returning. Who is returning where? What's going on? Meaning Allah is now returning back to his slave. Just like the slave is now returning back to Allah, so Allah is also turning back towards his slave by accepting his tawbah and bringing him closer towards himself. This is sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrates that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yistahidu ibadah ba'da nazuli hadhi surah hatta tawarramat qadamah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam engaged in excessive ibadah after this surah was revealed until his feet uh, became... Uh, uh, that his feet became sw swollen from standing in ibadah. <coughs> and this is the humbleness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and a reminder for us at the time of victory how when uh, if a person is going to be making tasbih of Allah, hamd of Allah and asking forgiveness of Allah, there's no opportunity for him to inflict zulm and oppression on others. How other victors, they come, they, they, um, they make the blood, streets flow with the blood of, of the conquered, van, vanquished people and they enslave them and they commit all kinds of atrocities and zulm and oppression. Instead of that, Rasulullah sallallahu he forgave all of them. And uh, he said, لا أقول لكم إلا كما قال يوسف بن يعقوب لإخوته I will not say anything more to you than what Yusuf ibn Yaqub said to his brothers. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم I don't even blame you for whatever happened. يغفر الله لكم May Allah forgive you. وهو أرحم الراحم Yusuf. And he's the most forgiving and most merciful of those who show mercy. The one when Usman ibn Talha, when he had asked him before going for uh, Hijrah, that please allow me to perform two rakat of salah in the Kaaba. And he refused him, said, no way, I'm not going to give it to you. Go away from here. He took the key of the Kaaba and he said, well, everyone was thinking, who is going to give the key to? He's going to give it to Ali, his nephew, his, uh, his cousin and his son-in-law, sorry. Or he's going to give it to Abbas, his uncle, the Banu Hashim. Who is he going to give the key to? He called Usman ibn Talha. And he said, Miftahaka Uthman. Oh, Uthman, take this key. Not Uthman ibn Affan, not his son-in-law. Uthman ibn Talha. Take this key, Uthman ibn Talha. It will remain with you and your progeny till the day of Qiyamah. Till today. You know, the Khulfai Rashidun came and left. Banu Mayya came and left. Banu Basia came and left. Banu the Uthmania dynasty, Ottoman Empire came and left. But till today, the Saudis are there. They cannot enter the Kaaba until the descendant from the family of Uthman ibn Talha, he opens the door. So Rasulullah sallallahu showed so much kindness to the one who treated him in the most rude manner. So this is part of the kafiyah, the quality that should come in the heart of anyone of us who when you're enjoying happiness and victory, making tasbih of Allah, hamd of Allah, and making istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant his ability to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see that victory once again in our times. 
and allow us to be deserving of that and engage in such ibadah of Allah and da'wah towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become uh, worthy of this great victory. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillah.